Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's get back to business. Um, Jeremy, are you on with us, sir? I am. Let me, let me start sharing my screen. Let me. Perfect. <laughs> I was okay. trying to get a better background than Dave. I mean, he's got his uh, natural in Puerto Rico. Uh, I was going to say, I'm a, I'm a little jealous of his backdrop. I can tell you that for sure. So uh, for those attending on the show, what I want to do is I want to introduce somebody by the name of Jeremy Walcott. Jeremy is involved in investments in real estate, but their primary focus has been on the multifamily space. And we've asked him to come on because this is a very interesting area of real estate that I find quite intriguing, somewhat confusing, uh, because it looks like a turnstile. Some people are going in, some people are coming out. And I know there's money made on both sides of the transaction, but Jeremy, thank you so much for coming today and for participating. And I think the audience is going to be very interested because this is a space many real estate investors look at and focus on. And it'd be very nice to see what your thoughts are on the market. Can you tell a little bit about your history, about yourself and about your company, if you would? Sure. Yeah. Let me, let me get this pulled up. First, I'll, I'll start by, you know, thank you. Know, appreciate you guys. Let me jump on and, and share, share the knowledge I have, you know, have experience in real estate and hopefully it adds some value to your group and yes, sir. all the folks online. So let me start to share my screen here. Let's do that. Now you're located where today, Jeremy? Because I think you're in Mexico. I'm, are you I'm not? a little further south than Dave. Um, I'm yeah. in I'm in Mexico, so I moved. I'm I'm a little further south than Dave. Are you in Mexico City or where are you at in Mexico? Uh, I'm in the, I'm on the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh -huh. So it's, you know, over, I always use, everybody knows where Cancun is. They probably don't know specifically where I'm at, but they, the, I use Cancun and then go four hours West. And there's a little city called Merida. The population's a million here, but we're trying to keep it, you know, a secret. So. Well, a million people is not a secret. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody ever knows where it is. I'm trying to figure out how to get this thing started. Go, you go, to your, see. go to your slideshow at the top of your slide, your presentation. Yeah. And then just go on the top line. It says design trans. I go to the right and it says slideshow. Yeah. Hit, hit that. And then hit from beginning. Yeah, there we go. All right. I haven't, man, you get so passive. You don't even know how to operate a PowerPoint. You know, no, my you, previous life, I did, I did work for a corporate finance job. You know, I worked for a little company in Plano called Pizza Hut and I was a financial analyst. So my background, I've got a finance degree. Yeah. and an MBA from Indian University South, Southeast. So I did have a day job back, you know, six years ago, I guess. Well, good. But, tell, me, tell us what you're doing. Tell us how you got started yeah. multifamily and tell us uh, how that career <clears throat> shifted, if you would. Yeah, for sure. Um, so for me, I, my wife and I, you know, we did that the typical model. Hey, both, you know, go to school, get good jobs. We both have master's degrees, get, you know, get a good job and, and, and live the good life. So we were doing that, both of us, you know, making six figures in the W-2 space. But then kind of what Dave alluded to, I didn't move to Puerto Rico to, you know, offset the taxes. I just kind of moved all my money to passive or real estate investment, which was the lowest bucket in terms of earned income versus long-term gains versus passive. So we, uh, we, we made the shift in 2012 is when we kind of really focused on real estate. We uh, had a couple of single family rentals then that we, um, that we did. And then that kind of morphed into, you know, I wanted to be scalable. I wanted to be more passive. Uh, I've got two young daughters that I want to spend time with. So I had to go as passive as I could. So apartments was the next logical step for me because then I could just become investor. Cause if you look at that, that EBS, EBIS crash flow quadrant triangle that Robert Kiyosaki talks about, as soon as I read the book, I knew I wanted to be an I B's are fun, but they still have accountability and work to do. I that just deploy capital now and you know help other folks get the good life, the great life that I've got. So, well, let, let's start. Let's start with that as a first question. I know we got sure. a lot of stuff, and I know you got slides, but I but I do want to ask this question as we get started. So, when we talk about uh, different mentors and different people yeah. that are are part of how your career got evolved, one question as you go through your presentation that's always in the back of everybody's mind is. What kind of money does it take to get started? What yep. kind of money does it take to get in apartments? What type of money are you talking about? Because I'm seeing your screen, 350 repeat partners. Uh, you got, you know, all these different transactions. And a lot of times people avoid space, including my industry, oil and gas, because they, they assume it's so big or so complex, you just can't play. And I'm very interested in seeing how your career shift from being an MBA, W2 type of a scenario into the 
which is really a very, very big space, the multifamily. And that, that's like yeah. jumping over, you know, the Eiffel Tower to try to get from A to B. So yeah. throw that into your presentation because I'm quite interested in that as well myself. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like, I mean, I started out like anybody does, like 2014 as a passive investor. I was part of a real estate group and met uh, Darwin German at that group. And he was syndicating a project and give a little history on syndication. That really didn't start taking off till 2012, the concept of, hey, let's get a hundred people together and 50,000 each use it's about 50,000 is the minimum investment in a project. So let's get a hundred people together with 50,000, you raise $5 million and let's go buy a 200 unit apartment in Arlington, Texas. So that concept is relatively still new. I mean, it's um, you know, 10 years as far as a mainstream, the mom and pop investor, myself included, able to you know get into a type of project like that. We have partners that use cash, you know, IRA funds, self-directed, uh, so, solo 401ks, trust, everything, you know, everything, you know, is available as far as that, the, the type, type of uh, capital you can use. But it's, it's, you know, the passive part of it was really nice to me. So I just, you know, 2014, we bought a 205 unit apartment in, in Arlington, Texas. And it was a dump, man. It was like the, the quintessential value add. Like my wife and I, we drove around the property and couldn't find the leasing office. The previous owner <laughs> didn't have an awning. It was, it was like doomsday. Like it looked like a haunted house, man. I'm like, this is 205 <laughs> units. I'm like, we, we just, we, I think at that on that one, I think we did 75,000. I'd cat. I'm, I'm going to probably scare our, our IRA friend or, but I cashed out my 401k when I left the W2 world. Cause I had had, you know, I had some money, but I hadn't accumulated, you know, 20, 30 years of work history. So it was, it was a check, but the opportunity cost was, you know, 10,000 to me is 10% of my, of my 401k that I, that I cashed out. So I put 70, I, you know, net, net after ordinary income and my 10% penalty since I wasn't waiting until 59 and a half to get to my money, uh, put it in that project in November of 2014 and just kind of crossed my fingers. <laughs> and the way I met Darwin is like, he, he'd been doing it since the name of his dad. Started in the '90s in Texas doing apartments, but he's been doing apartments all his life, so it was experience to me. You know, I'm use a little Kentucky analogy that you know I always look. You always want to bet on the jockey, not the yeah. horse. The horse is the diff, multiple different projects, but the jockey, you know, they they've ridden multiple horses, so he had 20 years experience. I mean, I great. I had a finance degree in ABA, but I hadn't been in that space, so I'm like, eh, worst case, I'll you know keep keep working, you know, get another finance job and get you know back in the W two world. So. I took that, you know, took that, the capital and put it to work and, you know, fast forward that story, uh, call it four years, that 75 K tripled. That was a triple in, in the numbers. So yeah, that was, that kind of started the process. Like, Hey, I didn't have to work that hard to, you know, accumulate this money. So let's, uh, let's keep doing this, you know, multiple times. So, okay. The, um, that, that, that was the first step. So, you have no, some slides ben. to go through too, don't you? So yeah, you, yeah, let's you, go you, through, some you, you go through yeah, your but, slides and then, you know, I think the main thing I want the audience to understand is that it doesn't take a million dollars to get started. What it no, takes is no, the first step with the right for, people. And it takes, it takes just a starting point. I just want to make sure we size what you do, because as yeah. you describe this, there is opportunities to invest with your company. There's the opportunities to get in the space. And I wanted to make sure as they listen to you, that it is all scalable with their investment yes. size as you do it. So go ahead and go through your presentation yeah, so we yeah, stay on track sure. with time. And, and thank you for that introduction yeah, that yeah, success yeah, yeah, to yeah. start with. Yes, sir. For sure. Yeah. Like, and just one more little note on that, on the starting. I, when I started in 2014, I was not an accredited investor. You know, I'll repeat that. I was not an accredited investor. So we have partners that aren't accredited by the possession of the SEC. So, I mean, you know, 50 K, is a starting point and, and then just go from there. So that's, okay. that's a kind of quick snapshot of the group. Perfect. And then I just added, you know, you know, why commercial real estate? I mean, Dave had some amazing stats and he has a, a ridiculous budget for, you know, you know, doing the research, but I, me and my friends at CoStar, they're pretty good. They're one of the larger ones for apartments. So I, I get a lot of stuff from Marcus and Millichap and CoStar and a lot of those guys that track the data, you know, they, uh, I lean on them for the knowledge. So this, this is a quick snapshot Pictures, you know, always, you know, have speak a thousand words. So I, this is just the last 20 years. I mean, this is real, the most relevant to me. I don't care what the price of real estate was in 88. I was eight years old. <laughs> so, I mean, I, the savings and thrift loan thing, I do know about that knowledge because Darwin was back there in his 20s doing it and, and saw all the crazy stuff happen in the 90s. But for me, this is my window of investment. So apartments, the price per unit, you know, as you can see, it, it, it's gone up. Rent's going up. 
whether it's flat for one year, the cost to rebuild that unit, the materials that go into that building it, and for sure that labor that builds that unit is going up every year. It's called inflation. So I, 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 this chart right here speaks volumes to me. I mean, you, you, we, we, they touched on the worst real estate adventure. It was 07, 08, 09. You can see that real estate came down. You know, the apartments per price per pound on the apartment went down in 08, 09, and 2010. But the last 10 years, I mean, you can kind of close your eyes, you know, and then the next question is, well, where are we going? I don't see we cut. I, mean, I think the 08, 09, this is my two cents. Again, I'm not an economist and most economists, if they're good, they'll tell you they're only half right. The t they're only right half the time. So that's, that's a good note to have, but it, I don't, you know, that, that's a 30 year, 30 year event that 09. I can't, you know, I always have a contrarian belief that uh, every, you know, we're going to be in 09 every minute. No, I, I have a portfolio, you know, and we have 2000 units in our portfolio and the, the residents at the end of the day, they, they go home when they come home from work, they, they, they go under a roof. They don't want to be on this, on the streets. Well, now. No well let me ask college. you this. Yeah, when, go ahead. When you're looking at time frame in this space, uh, specifically multifamily, every cycle, every space has, has a certain increment. What is the multifamily space when you think of time? Is it a three year hold, seven year hold, 10 year yeah. hold? We, we typically, you can, you yeah. spread across this time horizon if you have the right mindset right yeah for sure yeah and you look at any they, they say you look at any time period over a you know five to ten year period for real estate it you're gonna you're gonna make money even on, if you time the two bottoms now i will circle back to the stock market it was you know if you had money in the stock market from 2000 to 2010 in the mutual fund it was zero percent return for 10 years and i never wanted that so I, for the apartments, we usually look at a five-year time period when we do our projections. You know, the crystal ball breaks after the 60th month. So we kind of shoot for five years and it's, you know, that, that window, whether it's a yield project, meaning it, you know, shoot throws off cash flow, you know, and, or maybe a value add, which that's what we got into in, in 2014, 2015. I can talk specifically a couple of projects that I'm in passively that were value adds where there was not, not a lot of cash flow the first two years, but then we did a cash out refi and got a, check for 30 or 40% of our money back, which is pretty sweet. So I can sacrifice, you know, single digit cash flow for a you know, 30% so, check in a few So years. let me, let me, let me slow you down since I'm the dummy in the room. I'm going to help the audience because yeah. many of our investors, yeah. our, our attendees are not uh, familiar with the term. I, it's like me talking oil and gas. It sounds like I'm yeah. talking Chinese. So I got to go real slow. Yeah. Yeah. To help. Yeah. So, so let's go real slow. And when you talk about a yield investment, versus one of the other types of investments in like the value add. My interpretation is in some cases you're buying the, the asset because it's kicking off a great rate of return relative to the purchase price and the cost of capital. So it's about accumulating a higher rate of return than debt. You're making cash flow, you're making cash flow, and you expect to sell it for the same and a higher price as a result of stabilized income. So it's mostly a yield play, right? Is that correct? Well, yeah. Analysis? Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Typically it's, we, we've we've underwritten it on cash flow. The, the reason you know, why we purchased it, I mean, Darwin and the team, we have a, a, an acquisitions group. They they look at hundreds of opportunities, apart, specifically apartments, anywhere from a $10 million purchase price up to a $30 million purchase price of an apartment. So they look at hundreds of offering memorandums or properties that are potential, but we, you know, acquire, you know, two to three a year, maybe. Okay. So very, so very focused on the underwriting, but it's, yeah, you hold it for five years. You get some cash flow. Uh, the appreciation comes from, you know, we, we factor in the cap rate. Yeah, it's going to get down in the weeds if I get to the specifics of what a cap rate is. But in theory, it's the rent's going up over the five years. And then you're selling it based on the new net operating income number divided by that cap rate, whatever the market cap rate is. So it's typically higher because, you know, that the rent's always going up. And the cost of that building per the insurance quotes are going up. <laughs> so, so let's take the next category you mentioned, which is the value add approach. Right. Tell me what that means in simple terms, so the audience understands exactly what a value add opportunity is. Right. So, value value add is more you know focused on hey, we're going to you know defer some cash flow for a couple of years because we're we're going in and it's been you know it's got a lot of deferred maintenance. I mean, it, it's it's rough. So you've got to put a lot, inject a lot of capital, put a lot of money in the front end to redo a unit, upgrade you know, a portion of the property or, or the whole property to bring it up to a, you know, a, you know, a nicer level to, uh, to get the higher rent. So it's more of a focus on 
you know, renovation, rehab, repair, you know, and then, you know, typically the bank wants uh, to see, you know, 12 months to 18 months of a solid P&L with these new numbers, these new rent numbers that you're getting. And then they will, you know, re, you know, look at the value and be like, okay, yeah, here's the cash. You know, you've raised the value X. Now here, take 40% of your initial capital and give that back to the partners and still hold the property for cash flow. Which so is, it, it's, more of a, it's more of a fix and hold, but the yep. fixing part is identifying an asset that has a lot of potential upside, but it requires deferring the cash or the yield in the first couple of years, redeploying yes. the capital back into improving the asset value, then using financing engineering to help you pull out equity, which then accelerates your rate of return because now you have less money invested. Correct? Lower cost, of, cost basis. So yeah, I mean, the whole... Pr- both projects for us, our group, we're not fixing flippers. We uh, Darwin has a has a saying that you know multiple streams of cash flow you know make make you wealthy. Uh, flipping properties can make you rich. There's two different definitions of rich and wealth. Yes. This way you you deploy you know you're you're involved in ten apartment complexes with your money. You you know it they, they just plug along and every five years that goes through that cycle and you kind of just keep turning capital and it's growing. So it, it's it's even more less, uh, I'd say, less of a brain damage and for sure not a rectal extraction when it comes to this because it's, it's, it's a no-brainer. It's passive. And I, I get the double dip because, yeah, I'm part of the team and I help raise capital and I'm in investor relations. So I get to check a box for a professional real estate investor on that piece. But I'm not going to you know, hide that. I'm putting my own capital in these projects. I'm you know, on an average investment of 70 k I'm in 10 projects. So there's a round number of what I've got deployed in multifamily. So let's, so, let, let's ask a couple of questions. I know some of the, uh, the uh, viewing audience is yeah. going to be asking, because I know these are questions I'm asking. So, and we've got about 13 minutes. So we're gonna, I'm going to try to keep us tight just because what you have to say is very important. And it's a great subject or great content. So here's the first question. So I've been watching and I'm here in Dallas, Texas in, in North Dallas. And I've watched these monster apartment complexes being built the last five years. To me, I call them, they look like prisons because they're just big squares, five story tall. They're not the old product. You go in, they've got the whitewashed concrete hallways, no carpet, blah, blah, blah. And And I kept saying to myself, who is renting all these apartments? And they've got to be expensive based on construction costs, et cetera. So what is the pattern right now for apartments? Is there more people trying to get into apartments because they can't afford the financing on homes? Is it more that there's just a growth in the population? What's spurring this massive amount of apartment complex building? And I'm going to talk specifically Dallas because that's where I'm at. What's yeah, yeah, causing this sure. massive explosion of multifamily the last four or five years? Yeah, that's a, that's a great, great question, Troy. That's, that's where our, the bulk of our portfolio is in the DFW space. So we're pretty familiar with that area. Yes, uh, job growth, I would say population and job growth, the folks leaving the coastal cities coming to Dallas because of the cost of living compared to those two cities is half off. But okay. a lot of times, I mean, the, for folks so it's, here, so it's yeah, population but, migration, population, yeah, population migration, migration and, and fortune 500 companies relocating in their offices every other week, uh, an Amazon or a Google or Lockheed Martin or something like Chase is moving their corporate headquarters to DFW okay. or in the, in that, in that space. So population, population migration, number one, and also, you know, just, yeah, job relocation. So that forces people to move around. Uh, that, that kind of segues into this picture here, like the mortgage, like the rent, like the, the, the cost of a single family house. Now the average, I don't have all the numbers, so I'm just going to ballpark it. Uh, it's probably about 300,000 for a starter home now in Dallas. Yeah. So that's a serious income to be able to cover that. I mean, the banks are crazy. They'll loan whatever they can get because they don't care about you as a consumer. They like to make a interest rate. But as you can see, even in this chart, this is why I threw this in there because even in 06, 08, everybody was like, oh, the you know my mortgage payment dropped so much. Well, surprise, the banks didn't lose any money over eight years. They got back to that monthly mortgage payment that they were collecting from you in 06 because the value of the property went up. Right. Right. That's mortgage payment. Like, so that the banks didn't really get hurt. They were like, I'll get you on the front end because of, you know, because of the interest rates were high and higher in 06. And I'll get you on the back end because now the asset that you have costs more. So I'm still getting that same amount of mortgage. So it's kind of funny when you look at it from that stance as a, as an owner. So a lot of folks are deferring that, that, you know, purchasing a home, moving to the suburbs, starting families. I've saw that they start families now later, you know, late twenties. And now is the time when people start, start having families. So they're more, 
you know, I would say professional gypsies. This is a word I use. Like they're they're trying to climb the corporate ladder, so they would rather rent a 12 month downtown and in, in downtown Dallas to be close to work than you know than to buy a house out in Colleyville, South Lake, Frisco. I don't know, pick one. So so, it, so it, let me ask you this. Uh, right right now, what I'm seeing from my vantage point is I'm seeing uh, a raging inflation coming in the next 24 months, which means higher interest rates. And, right. and I would be of the mindset that as interest rates rise, cost of consumer goods, such as materials, raw lumber, copper, steel, sheetrock, all that's going to rise. So that means housing prices are going to rise, land costs are going to rise. But more importantly is interest rates are going to rise, forcing more people to not qualify for those more expensive homes. Do you see a real, I mean, even though I'm seeing all these massive apartment complexes, my logic says, a lot of people are not going to be able to afford those homes. So they're going to continue to stay in those apartment complex. And it actually could increase the apartment complex uh, uh, the occupancy demand. demand, right? For sure. Yeah, yeah. The demand is always going to increase. Yeah, 100%. That's um, interest rates. I don't know. My thought, you know, talking to some of the economists, they, they don't know. I mean, it's hard to raise the interest rate if you want to keep the economy growing. If you should, you know, if you raise interest rates, the economy usually slows down even more. So I don't know if they're well, they're at, they're at zero, Jeremy. I don't know how much lower they can go. I mean, they can go well, negative we like the UK. <laughs> we could, yeah, we go to Japan and get, or get a neg- or Venezuela. I heard they got a good negative yield CD if you want yeah. to get in on them. The they just break your legs when you don't pay them back. That's all. It's, it's negative yield. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, I yeah. guess what I'm getting at is that the yeah. feds have done all they can do, but now we see yeah. that, that mortgage loan applications dropped this week. We see that you yeah. know now there's a lot. I mean, my wife and I were going to sell our house and move kind of out of town, but the prices are 30, 40 percent higher. We're like, we're yeah, not paying yeah. that price. So I think there's a lot of pressure on the on the residential side. And, and my only conclusion is with a large portfolio that you guys have and that you manage and you're buying and selling, because I know you guys are either refinancing or buying and selling. That's kind of the confusing part to me is there's a lot of rotation taking place in the multifamily. Right. People are exiting right. apartments. They've probably been in four or five years because they've reached their goal of gains or rate of return or refinancing. And there's a lot of people entering the market. Is that a normal rotation that's taking place today in that multifamily? Or is it is it a higher pace today? People are thinking that maybe the 1031 exchange is going to go away under the new administration. What, what's causing this rotation? Because it seems like it's gone crazy the last six months in the multifamily. Yeah, I think I just think people, yeah, they, that'll continue to go. There'll be people exiting and, and, and entering the market as they learn, you know, as people learn about it. But for us, we want to be in the market the whole time. As far as timing the market, we just want to be in the market because we've timed it by buying properties in 2016 that have tripled your money. I mean, I, there's don't get greedy, you know, just cash that check and then then be be realistic that, yeah, I don't expect a, you know, a couple of the properties that I'm in passively are ridiculous. I mean, these aren't realistic numbers, so I don't, I'm afraid to even share them, but 40% return per year, 50% return per year. So we got to redeploy that capital somewhere. So, I mean, I, I've already, I'm playing with the house's money. So when I, you know, go and buy a property, we closed on a class A apartment built in 2018 out in West Fort Worth, uh, $26 million loan, uh, 3%, 3.1% interest rate for 10 years. I mean, that's, that's just free money. And so we're, we're taking those gains that we've tripled and then parking it in a boring cash flowing, you know, 12 to 15% return per year so, apartment so, that's not going anywhere. So we're, 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 we're personally rotating our capital as the portfolio, but I, there's always going to be people coming and going. But the key thing I want to circle back to is I would get involved with somebody that knows what they're doing. Like, you know, people that have been doing it five years or less, you saw the chart, the previous slide. I mean, it's all in up market. So you've got to buy more cautiously. The, there's not low hanging fruit. The value add projects are few and far between. It's more of a, you know, a yield project now. So th- that's would, for us. Would you, would, you, would you say that the way that you're looking at your, and I'm just paraphrasing here, but would you say when you look at the market and multifamily from your perspective and, and Darwin German's perspective, that it's simply a, a laddering up in the quality of your portfolio yes, by taking le- le- lesser properties, maybe in dollar amount, unit size, location, using those gains from smartly placed investments five, six years ago to then accumulate those gains, use the tax advantage of a 1031 and now buying a class A apartment that is pretty much on autopilot with nice stabilized returns. So you don't may not have that 40% annualized return, but you've got a much, much bigger engine generating a higher cash volume. So the overall return is better. Yes. Percentage yep. is not better. Is that kind of what I see? Hundred percent, hundred percent home run, dude. You, you, you're, you're already multi. You, you, you want to hire me, don't you? <laughs> come on, come on, let's do it. That's perfect because yeah, like 
that's my idea. If you take a hundred K and turned it into 300 K, I'm okay getting 10 to, you know, 12 to 15% on the new 300 K. That's I didn't right. Expect. Yeah. So it, it, that's, that, that's a one example. Um, the 1031. Now that I will point out that part and you'll like this part. Um, the 1031 to do an syndication is not available. So I kind of defer my friends to you because you can do 1031s with mineral rights, man. I, we can't like when we have a syndication with 40 partners, you can't bring the gain from your single family house into that transaction. It's a correct LLC. So I'm like, Hey, call my buddy, Troy, they can 1031 that one single family house in South Dallas and avoid paying taxes. So I'm all about that. I like the tax benefits of apartments. We haven't even really touched on that is the, these two magic words called depreciation and cost segregation yeah. where I can accelerate that stuff the first couple of years. So I always, invest with cash. I, yeah. I cash. I don't have any IRAs, 401ks, nothing. I just have, you know, and every, sometimes I have piles of cash. Sometimes I have, you know, little stacks of cash, but I always am using cash because as a professional real estate investor, that, uh, that tax carry forward deduction every year is pretty nice. It's, it's unlimited versus where if you're passive, then you've got to kind of work in that, work in that space. But I, well, let's, let's do this. Yeah. Cause I, I know we're down to three minutes and I want to give you yeah, the benefit. Me. First off, Tell the audience how you would like to see maybe some of our qualified investors maybe consider Darwin German as an yeah, investment cool. opportunity and, and how they contact you and what that investment looks like. Give us a 60 second synopsis. If I have a hundred to $200,000 to invest, how do I get hold of you? How do I invest? What does the time frame yeah. look like and what mm-hmm. kind of performance? Just give me your sales pitch real quick. Yeah, I for hear sure. It. No, I appreciate it. I'm not, I'm not the greatest sales guy, but I I'm probably could be your friend pretty quick. So that's I, good. I, um, I look at it as, hey, we've got, we've got, oh, we've always got a project going. Here's my contact information. That's my personal cell phone number, you know, and my email. That's a Louisville, Kentucky area code number. So now my story that I was from Kentucky is is factual because I've had that for over 20 years. So just, right. you know, shoot me an email or a text or a phone call, and you know, we can talk. We've got a couple projects going, but you know, from a standpoint, what's my investment to do if I give you 100k? Okay, right. uh, we're shooting. We shoot for 12 to 15 percent you know, return on a project over five years. So your hundred K turns into 175 K at, at the end of 60 months, okay. along with the, you know, depending on if you use IRA or cash, what the tax benefits are or just kind of cash, fl- cash flows pay. annually cash flow. Is cash, it more of- so your cash flow on that you're looking, we, we do like a six, six or 7% pref annually. Okay. okay. And you know, if, if that first year, if it's a, it's more of a value idea, the strategy is a value, then we would, you know, you get the first seven percent pref. So when we do start paying cash flow, you get the first seven k. So it accumulates, yeah. and the pref yeah. is paid out first, right? Yeah, yeah, cumulative. And then the other part on the back end, this is important that a lot of folks miss when they're looking at other projects from other syndicators is we pay out a hundred percent of the print at liquidation. We pay out a hundred percent of the principal to passive to make them whole. Like your hundred k, we've given you back ninety thousand dollars over the four years, and then we sell it. You get the first ten k. And then we do this, the, the sponsor split or whatever for the equity portion. But it's it's definitely, you know, it's not as sexy as, you know, you know, flipping or, you know, I, I'm actually pretty impressed with it. Mineral rights. I'm excited because I just got in last July and eager to do more as more of my properties. <laughs> so I'm going to kind of turn the money there. But well, just so, you, just so you end up, end up on a good note, I think we'll just cross sixty six dollars a barrel while we've been talking. So it's up two dollars. today. So, Dude, you know, beautiful. Two things. You enjoy yourself down in Mexico. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing with us. We've got a lot of information. For those that are listening, listen, you need to get hold of Jeremy. Look at their projects. Talk about the details because here's the way I see it. We need a balanced portfolio in the alternative investment space. You know, we need some real estate. We need some loans. We need some minerals. But here's the thing. I'm going to tell everybody as I see it. You have got to invest with people you trust who are experts in their space. I don't want the guy saying this week I'm in this, this week I'm in that. I've been doing this for a month and a half. It's experience, it's expertise. And Jeremy with Darwin German, it looks like you guys offer all the above. So check the box. So call Jeremy, talk to him about what you can do. Jeremy, thanks so much for your time, my friend. You have a great weekend and I look forward to seeing you here in the States when you come back, my friend. For sure. I'll see you in Colorado for sure, boss. Okay. Sounds good, my friend. Take care. All right. Okay.